Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to this UCL Center for Applied Linguistics lunchtime seminar. Now, I know it might not be lunchtime uh, wherever you are around the world, and it looks like we've got a really international audience for this talk, and we're delighted about that. Um, to hear our uh, featured speaker today, uh, Dr. Sin Wang Chong, um, who is lecturer in TESOL at the School of uh, Social Sciences, Education, and Social Work at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. Ireland. Um, Sin Wang, I think it is fair to say, is very much a ri rising star in our field. Um, you know, he finished his PhD by publication uh, about a year ago, I, I understand, and um, at the University of Su Sunderland, um, prior to which he was teaching at the University of Hong Kong, and then started his lectureship um, at uh, Queen's University Belfast, I believe in July of last year. So um, although Xin Wang is an early career researcher, um, I think it's fair to say that you've got the profile Seen Wang very much of a uh, mid-career researcher and somebody, again, who's on a steeply upward ac academic trajectory. Um, so what's really, um, I think, unique about the work that you do, Sin Wang, for example, on feedback and the fledgling area of uh, feedback literacy, is it really is it the nexus of uh, different academic um, fields and it brings together um, educational assessment, language assessment, um, higher education, and um, second language acquisition. Uh, so it's very innovative work that sort of brings people out of these um, academic silos. And this is also reflected in uh, the journals that you publish in, um, you know, assessment in education and evaluation in higher education. So higher education journals and uh, language assessment journals like Language Assessment Quarterly, assessing writing, um, also ELT journal, um, and language learning and technology, and there are others. Um, today, uh, Sin Wang is going to be talking about research synthesis methodologies, and I understand that you have a forthcoming publication in TESOL Quarterly uh, with uh, Luke Plonsky, Sin Wang, on looking at qualitative uh, research synthesis. Um, so, that, so congratulations, we look forward to reading that article. Um, Sin Wang is also uh, very involved in sort of uh, editorial duties. Um, so I believe associate editor of education, uh, sorry, higher education research and development and innovation in language learning and teaching. Um, and uh, Sin Wang has also published um, a couple of books uh, with Routledge, uh, one on uh, developing writing skills for IELTS and another um, called Metacognitive Mindscapes, um, again to do with, e well, this one to do with secondary uh, EFL students writing. Um, so those books both came out in 2020 um, with another book underway on uh, looking at PhD by publication and, um, you know, getting uh, recording experiences and narratives of those, um, you know, journeys. Um, Sin Wang is also uh, one of the uh, inaugural winners of the Reviewer of the Year Award um, in 2020 for the Higher Education Research and Development Journal, so a very, very impressive track record. Um, Sin Wang is also organizing numerous um, events, uh, online um, fora. fora. Um, there is one for the British Association for Applied Linguistics. Actually, I believe there were two works, two events that um, you're organizing for Ball um, Sin Wang. Um, one is on research synthesis and is upcoming, and um, I'll be sure to announce details of that uh, for, the, for those of you who might be interested. Um, there's an upcoming one um, for the UK Association um, for language testing and assessment. Um, and Sin Wang um, is also um, a BIRA, so the British um, Educational Research Association uh, Early Career uh, Research uh, Network Regional Rep for Northern Ireland. So is involved in um, you know, bringing together uh, early career researchers in a leadership uh, capacity. So we are absolutely delighted to have you here um, today, Sin Wang, to talk about this very important topic of uh, research synthesis, which um, in applied linguistics and TESOL, which I know uh, is of great interest. So thank you very much and look forward to your talk. And just to say to everybody um, that the format today will be that Sing Wang is going to talk uh, for a, roughly an hour. Um, and please, as you have questions or comments or reflections, um, type those into the text bar, into the chat. Um, and then um, I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll be able to chair and read out some of those questions and um, 
and we can have a discussion in that way. Thank you. Thanks, Sinwang. Thank you very much, uh, Talia, for a wonderful uh, and detailed introduction. Uh, thanks so much for the in invitation, uh, Jim and Talia. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to uh, talk to all, all of you about research synthesis uh, here. Um, so today my talk is a, a little bit ambitious. I'm trying to present a typology of uh, 13 types of secondary research in applied linguistics and TESOL, and I aim to do that very nicely, hopefully uh, in the coming hour or so. Um, so I have to um, acknowledge that this work that I present is actually based on a work that we I currently finished with uh, Luke Plonsky. We've just submitted our paper uh, called the exact the same uh, the, the exact same topic, a typology of secondary research in applied linguistics. So um, I have asked Luke uh, for his permission, and he is very glad that I will be sharing this uh, with everyone. So uh, for today's uh, presentation, I want to divide it into four major parts. The first part, I'm going to kind of introduce the, the, uh, the, the notion of secondary research in applied linguistics and TESOL. And I'm going to uh, describe the analytical framework, which uh, Luke and I used to analyze 13 types of secondary research. And of course, the, the meaty part would be the 13 types of secondary research. Uh, I will try to be very succinct, but at the same time informative. Um, I will also try to include uh, examples um, uh, and screenshots of papers, which I can't do uh, in a journal article. Um, and finally, I will end with implications and recommendations. So um, you will notice that um, in, in the first slide, I actually changed the title uh, of my presentation. So originally in the promotional materials, it's research synthesis, and now it's secondary research. Um, and it's it actually, the change was a result uh, of uh, my discussion with Luke about what, what is really research synthesis and what is secondary research. And to us, uh, secondary research seems to be a more appropriate term to talk about, you know, like an umbrella term to talk about the different types of literature review. So what I mean by secondary research in this talk and in our paper, it's basically literature review. And there are, as all of you will know, there are basically two types of secondary research. The very traditional one, or we can sometimes say it's non-systematic one, but I really prefer the term traditional because um, non-systematic sounds a little bit negative. Uh, and there is, of course, the systematic family. And this is precisely what we call research synthesis. So whenever I use the term research synthesis, I'm referring to systematic secondary research or systematic literature review. And of course, we know for research synthesis, there are qualitative research syntheses and quantitative research syntheses like meta-analysis. All right. So I, I would like to start by briefly talking about secondary research in applied linguistics. So what is secondary research? As I said uh, in, in the terminologies page, that secondary research basically is uh, literature review. It's a standalone piece of literature review, not the uh, lit, lit review chapter in a dissertation. So ba it's basically a scholarly review of a body of literature on a selected topic. So as I pointed out earlier, there are, there are two types of secondary research. One is traditional secondary research, another is systematic secondary research. And in the typology, I will cover both types. Um, why is traditional secondary research important? It, traditional secondary research, research has been here in the field for a, a pretty long time, usually in the form of a narrative review, for example. It's very important because it tells a story about a field. It tells a story about the development of, uh, of a topic or an area of research. Uh, sometimes the traditional secondary research will include a critique and analysis of existing literature about what has been covered and what hasn't been covered, and then to make suggestions for future research. But at the same time, we're seeing there is a growing interest 
in systematic secondary research and what distinguishes systematic secondary research from traditional secondary research is that the uh, synthesis when they conduct the review they would apply a formal set of methods uh, in the review process, for example, they will have a predetermined procedure for uh, the key strings, the search strings, uh, the research questions, the search strategies, the uh, data extraction procedures, and the data synthesis uh, procedures, for example. Uh, we have seen a lot of interest in a particular type of systematic secondary research uh, namely meta-analysis. And of course, you will know that uh, Luke Plonsky has done a lot of amazing work on meta-analysis. And I think people have been picking up on that and a lot of meta-analyses uh, appear in recent years, in, in the past decades. There is also another type uh, of uh, systematic secondary research called qualitative research synthesis, which focuses on synthesizing and summarizing qualitative research findings. And as Talia said, um, uh, one of my papers with Luke on, on qualitative research synthesis has just been accepted by uh, TESOL Quarterly. So uh, this is, I think, one of the first papers in TESOL to talk about qualitative research synthesis. Um, and another evidence of a growing interest in systematic secondary research is a growing body of methodological papers. For example, in one of the latest uh, book on uh, research methods in applied linguistics, uh, edited by Jim, actually. Uh, there, there are two chapters on systematic secondary research. One is uh, McCarroll's uh, systematic reviews chapter, another is on meta-analysis. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons why there is a growth of systematic secondary research in applied linguistics and in TESOL, because I think that the, the, the primary reason to me is the status of uh, research synthesis has changed from a kind of, you know, state of the art uh, think piece or commentary to a form of empirical research that is equivalent to primary uh, research and people believe that this kind of secondary research is necessary to consolidate existing findings and to point to future research uh, directions and to guide the development of um, the field. Um, and the second reason uh, is that uh, if you look at systematic secondary research in recent years, they are no longer produced by only senior scholars who offer their authoritative opinions. Usually in the past, when somebody writes a review, it's mostly people who are the big names. They have a very established prestige um, and status in the field, and they kind of give their authoritative opinions and comments about the field and to guide the field forward. But now with the growth of systematic secondary research, we see more and more junior scholars uh, working together with uh, methodologists, synthesis, uh, and librarians even to, to conduct this kind of systematic secondary research. Um, I think the last reason why um, people are very interested in systematic secondary research is because of its practical implication. And I think this is one of the points I will highlight in my implications, because when people think about research th synthesis, they think about research implications because the name is research synthesis. But I, I would like to argue that research synthesis uh, plays a very, very important role in bridging the research practice nexus, uh, informing policy making, informing practice. So um, in this second part, I would like to introduce the analytical framework that uh, Luke and I use to analyze the 13 types of secondary research in applied linguistics and TESOL. Um, there have been a lot of taxonomies, typologies of secondary research in different fields. Uh, the earliest is in social sciences and you will see frameworks uh, in medical sciences, um, health sciences and healthcare. Um, and, but we don't really see one uh, in, in applied linguistics and TESOL. So we decided to create our own. Uh, but there are a number of disclaimers before I present um, the, the framework and also the 13 types of secondary research. And I think it's very important for, for all of you to know why we are doing this. Now, so this typology 
uh, that I'm going to present to you is not a result of a comprehensive and fully systematic literature search. So we present this paper as a commentary. Uh, it's not a, a systematic literature review, uh, although considerations were given as to what kinds of reviews to include as examples in the typology using our experiences. Um, and we also have to acknowledge that the analysis of the included reviews will um, represent our own views and maybe sometimes biases and our experiences as primary and uh, synthetic researchers. Two more disclaimers, I think they're very important. So uh, this typology is not intended to be conclusive and definitive because I think it is, it is a very dynamic uh, uh, area of research methodology in, in applied linguistics. So we really regard this typology as a work in progress and we invite other people to contribute and revise and build on this typology. Um, and then even though we're presenting 13 types of secondary research, uh, we would like to uh, emphasize that the, the types of secondary research sometimes overlap and I will show you some examples later on. So uh, we are not saying that uh, the types are mutually exclusive. So I think these four disclaimers are very, very important uh, to set the tone for our discussion. Oh, so uh, on the flip side, what is the rationale? Why are we doing this? We want to do this and develop a typology because we would like to offer an overview of this very emergent and versatile set of methodological techniques. To hoping to standardize some of the naming traditions and methodological conventions. And we would like to introduce to the field uh, some potential approaches uh, to conducting secondary research that might be useful to a particular topic, uh, or sometimes uh, it's uh, quite new to the field. Uh, for example, uh, I'll be talking about historical review and bibliometric review, which are quite new. Uh, to the field. All right, so um, this is the analytical framework. I'm not going to get it. I really want to spare some time for the 13 types. So we're basing this analytical framework on existing uh, works. Uh, and basically we look at four areas for each type of review. We look at the purpose, for, uh, first of all, uh, it's the review focusing on research or uh, practice, or is the review focusing on both? Uh, and then the second area we would like to look at is the review process. Is the review process systematic, more systematic or less systematic? Uh, I, we would really refrain from using the term non-systematic because I think, you know, when people write, they um, tend to think about what they write and how to structure it. Um, so, and the third area is the text itself. So whether it's a monomodal text, meaning just words, or, re, uh, or multimodal text, like uh, using diagrams, tables, figures. And the last area we will look at is the structure uh, of the text. So whether uh, the review employs more standardized structure or a less standardized structure. So now this uh, comes to the, um, the meaty part uh, of this presentation is the 13 types of uh, secondary research. So I just want to give you an overview. So uh, we'll be talking about critical review, meta-analysis, methodological syn uh, synthesis, mixed review, uh, narrative review, qualitative research synthesis, research agenda, uh, research into practice, scoping review, um, state-of-the-art review, systematic literature review, historical review, and bibliometric review. So as you can see on this slide, some of the names you are quite familiar, uh, some of them less familiar. So uh, we'll start from the first type. So the first type of secondary research I like to introduce to everyone is critical review. And the purpose of critical review is research focused because it aims to explore different views uh, on a certain research topic, and sometimes they offer uh, alternative perspectives, therefore uh, the name is called critical, um, and they sometimes would discuss key questions that emerge uh, within a target domain. Uh, critical review in terms of review process is usually less 
systematic in a sense that there is no explicit description, for example, on how the literature included was searched and appraised and how the findings from the primary studies are, are synthesized and analyzed. The text itself is monomodal because the information is usually represented using words. Um, and then the structure, uh, as you can imagine, would be less standardized. It often employs a narrative approach discussing um, different issues in a thematic um, uh, ways. And the authors of critical review will often present arguments and views and then substantiate the arguments with uh, examples of individual studies. So this is uh, one example of critical review uh, on age-related research um, and L2 attainment. And then this is um, another one on uh, technology and task-based language teaching, offering a very critical view on the role of technology uh, in um, communicative language teaching. The second type is uh, meta-analysis. And I think this type of secondary research needs no introduction. I mean, if I have to pick one type of uh, secondary research that, uh, research that is the most common and popular in applied linguistics and TESOL, it would be meta-analysis. And I think Luke will be in a much, much better position to talk about this than me, but I will attempt to just uh, provide an overview. Um, so the purpose, of course, is research focused. The aim of meta-analysis is to uh, investigate the effects, uh, efficacies of different pedagogical interventions and identify the moderating effects of different variables. Um, and the review process, as you will know, is very systematic. They often have a separate method section or methodology section uh, with subsections dedicated to how literature is searched, what is the coding process, what is the anal uh, analysis and synthesis process. And of course, uh, being a quantitative type of uh, secondary research, uh, both descriptive and sometimes inferential st uh, statistics uh, are used. And the text is mostly multimodal because of the um, um, of the quantitative data, uh, researchers would very often employ figures, tables, and bullet points to document the review process in addition to words. Um, and the structure, as you can imagine, will be more standardized. It would follow a standard structure like a primary study, like um, you know, introduction, lit review, methodology, findings, discussion, conclusion, implications, uh, and usually with uh, some supplementary online documents. So this is uh, one example. There are so many examples of meta-analysis. I'm sure you, you, you know uh, some yourselves as well. So this is one on the efficacy of written corrective feedback, summarizing the uh, effectiveness of different types of written corrective feedback. I think it makes sense because uh, in WCF research, there is this whole line of quasi-experimental studies, uh, which are all summarized in this very nice study. And here is um, another one uh, on second language anxiety and achievement. Again, the authors, they are investigating the effect sizes uh, and also looking at the different variables uh, mitigating the effects. The third type of re uh, secondary research is methodological synthesis. Um, so uh, as you can tell from the name, it's, it's about the methodology. So the purpose of this type of synthesis is of course, research focused. And uh, this kind of synthesis focuses on assessing and describing and summarizing different methodological approaches, tools, uh, designs and paradigms, usually within a given substantive a domain, for example, critical discourse analysis. Um, and then they uh, offer their suggestions on maybe alternative tools uh, for an investigation. The review process uh, is usually more systematic. They uh, are, are systematic in a sense that uh, they document the research process, the review process very systematically. Uh, for example, they will document the coding process or how the reliability of coding is maintained. For example, they will have the uh, inter-rater reliability. 
um, or they will describe how uh, disagreements are resolved, for example, through discussions, meetings. Um, they are also systematic uh, at the analytical level because they will present information like uh, calculated percentages and frequencies of different methodological tools. The text itself is often multimodal. Uh, usually, uh, they will present paragraphs together, sorry, together with uh, figures and tables. And the structure, as you can imagine, because it's more systematic, it, uh, the structure is more standardized, uh, reminiscent of other research syntheses. Some examples for, for, for all of you, this is a, a methodological synthesis published in language learning on cluster analysis. Um, and then they look at different methodological practices. Uh, they analyze the strengths and weaknesses of each practice. Here is um, another one uh, on task-based learner production. So this methodological review focuses on a particular substantive domain, which is task-based uh, learner production. And again, very similar focuses um, on the efficacies uh, of uh, the affordances and constraints of existing uh, methodological tools. All right, the fourth type of uh, secondary research in applied linguistics and TESOL is mixed review. Um, so mixed review is a type of review that combines two types of review to offer more in-depth or sometimes complementary insights on a particular research topic. So I think you will understand that this is more research focused. The review process um, can, be, can vary and uh, it, it's dependent on the types of reviews included. So sometimes mixed review can be more systematic. Sometimes it could be less systematic if the two types of review uh, combined uh, belong to the traditional uh, secondary research families like uh, a narrative review. Um, so the text itself is usually multimodal because they are usually longer texts because they are essentially presenting two secondary research, two pieces of secondary research in one article. So uh, they would often use um, supplementary online materials uh, for all the um, like the uh, primary data or they are in a, uh, their analytic, uh, analytical process. The structure is usually more standardized. And from our analysis, we identify two approaches for combining the two types of review in one. One is called the convergent approach in which they present the findings of two secondary research together and um, the findings present complement each other. The second approach is the sequential approach. So essentially what the authors do is to present one review after the other. I will give you some examples later. So this is, um, this is uh, an example of a mixed review published in language learning. So it's a mixture of narrative review and systematic literature reviews. And you can look at the page numbers, the page range uh, at the bottom of the slide. So 321 to 391, so it's 70 pages. So it's very, very long because they're presenting two, uh, second, two pieces of secondary research in one article. This is um, another um, example also from language learning. Um, and this time it's a combination of um, um, a meta-analysis and a qualitative research synthesis uh, on the topics uh, of second language task complexity. So let me show you an example of a convergent approach. So in this example, you can see that there are altogether five research questions. And the first four research questions are answered in the first review, which is a qualitative research synthesis. And in the fifth uh, research question, which is about effect, uh, is answered by uh, the second review, which is a meta-analysis. So this is what we call a convergent approach because the research questions are answered by drawing on the findings from the two reviews. The other example I'm presenting on this slide uh, adopts a sequential approach to mixed review. So essentially they present 
uh, the authors present, first of all, the narrative review of the topic, and then they present the methodologies, the, the findings and the discussion, and then they present a second review on the same topic. This is a, system, a systematic literature review. Uh, and then they present it as a standalone uh, review. Uh, and of course, they will have a conclusion on both uh, at the very end uh, of their paper. Um, the fifth type of uh, secondary research is something that I think needs no introduction. It's narrative review. It has been in the field for a very, very long time. The purpose of a narrative review is research focused. It's usually used uh, to map the state of the art in a given domain. And usually the people who write them are leading scholars in the field and they are offering their authoritative views and uh, suggestions uh, to researchers. Um, the review process is often less systematic. So there is not a tradition of documenting the review process. There is no mention of uh, why the, the studies are included and how the studies are selected. Um, and then for the text itself, it's usually monomodal because um, it relies mostly on words. Um, and the structure, as you can imagine, is less standardized. They often adopt a thematic approach. You can see the section headings representing different uh, important themes uh, in a given domain. So these two are, uh, the, uh, are the examples of narrative reviews uh, published in Applied Linguistics. Um, one review is on L2 pronunciation instruction. The other one is on um, uh, L2 grammar acquisition. Something very interesting is that this, these two reviews, narrative reviews are published in the same issue in the same journal. And as you know, this is a very, very reputable uh, journal in our field. And something very interesting that we found is that even though these two are the same types of reviews. They are published in the same journal. They're published in the same uh, issue. Um, their approach to review, I mean, the review process is not entirely the same. So I would like to uh, just uh, draw your attention to this. Um, for uh, one of the examples in the issue, uh, it represents a more traditional narrative uh, review. Uh, approach. So for example, here, um, uh, this is the only paragraph that I could find about the methodology of the narrative review. Um, and basically the authors uh, mentioned that they draw the studies from a list um, and but, but we don't really have the information about what the how the list uh, was developed, how many studies were, in the list. So we just know that there is a list that the, the authors refer to, uh, to, to uh, summarize findings. Um, and then in the, in the findings part of this more traditional narrative review, you can see the structure, the, the approach of argumentation is that they present an argument and then they give an example, uh, they, give a, 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 they uh, describe a study as an example, they mention a point, and then use another study as an example. They mention a third point, and then they use another study as an example. So this is um, uh, uh, more representative of a traditional narrative review. Now, interestingly, another narrative review in the same journal in the same issue, also called a narrative review, uh, employs a more systematic uh, methodology, a methodological approach. So in the uh, methodology section of this narrative review, we actually see information like uh, the number of studies. We know there are 75, uh, sorry, 75 studies in, um, in, in the review. And also there, there is brief description on how the information is tabulated, uh, what are the steps of, um, of analyzing those 75 studies. And the systematic approach continues in the description and reporting of the findings. For example, uh, in addition to presenting key themes in the domain, in the substantive domain, um, the authors actually calculated the percentage that how many studies talk about a particular theme. So 78%, 12% talking about you know, something else, 56% talking about something else. So it shows the, 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 the readers that they have actually looked at 
the whole list and categorize and code all studies and um, into different themes or sub themes. So it's very interesting. And we're not making a comment here, which is better. And we're not saying which is wrong or right. But we just found this really interesting that for narrative review, which has existed in the field for a very long time. Um, and very interestingly, we have very different understanding um, of narrative review. And it, um, and even more interestingly, the, the different types of narrative review are published in the same issue in the same journal. Number six is something that I personally am very passionate about, um, qualitative research synthesis. Um, it has been in other fields for quite a while, like in the field of healthcare, uh, medicine, they use this to kind of synthesize, uh, for example, patients' experiences. Um, so, but then in TESOL and in uh, applied linguistics, this is almost, almost unheard of. So um, um, let's talk about this uh, for a while. So uh, qualitative research synthesis usually synthesizes qualitative data in classroom-based studies. So on the one hand, it is research focused, but at the same time, it has very strong practice uh, uh, orientations. Um, it aims to unravel the complexities of naturalistic and ecological research studies. Uh, for example, looking at uh, learners' experiences, uh, looking at um, perceptions, beliefs. Um, and the review process is very systematic. It's a systematic type of uh, secondary research. We follow a set of systematic uh, protocol uh, from searching to coding to synthesizing. Um, and the text itself is usually multimodal. Uh, so we present textual information together with diagrams and tables. As you can imagine, we'll be doing a lot of coding and synthesis, and it's, it's very useful to present the codes and thematic structure in diagrams or tables. Structure is often more standardized following a standard structure of a primary research paper. Um, here, are, here are two examples. The first one is actually uh, written by me and Heil Reinders uh, on technology mediated TBLT. Um, um, and it's a qualitative research synthesis on uh, 16 studies. And as you can see in the abstract, we talk about affordances and limitations of technology mediated TBLT. We talk about factors affecting effectiveness of this particular intervention. Um, this is another one. Uh, published slightly earlier, um, again, very interestingly in the field, uh, in the area of computer-assisted language learning. So this is a, a technology-supported peer feedback um, in writing class. It's a, a synthesis of qualitative data um, uh, using grounded theory as the um, analytical approach. Um, one, of the, one of the things I would like to mention here, and it, it responds to uh, the, the rationale uh, I mean, why we're doing this typology is if you look at the title of this example, it, it doesn't actually say qualitative research synthesis. So, uh, but then actually, if you read the whole thing, it's actually qualitative research synthesis. So the naming convention is something we really want to address because sometimes if we want to conduct a methodological analysis of uh, secondary research, we want to target a particular type like qualitative research synthesis, we can't locate all studies because they are naming the, the reviews using different names. So that, that's one of the impetus uh, for us uh, to uh, present this typology. Um, and then the type of, of uh, research synthesis is research agenda. And as the name suggests, uh, the purpose of a research agenda is to set the agenda for a research field. So uh, usually the researchers discuss uh, research tasks. Uh, they summarize current knowledge and identify research gaps. Um, the review process uh, is less systematic uh, from our understanding. They do not report any methods used to search and screen and uh, synthesize and extract um, data. For, uh, the text is multimodal usually, so uh, the important information is usually presented in table form um, to enhance clarity and impact. Um, the structure is usually more individualized. Uh, it's structured uh, thematically with different section headings. 
So there are two structural approaches that we identified and we offer two example studies here. The first approach is to present the key themes in a particular substantive domain together with a, response, uh, a corresponding research task. So for example, theme one in a particular topic plus the research task corresponding to theme one and then theme two, research task two, theme three, research task three. The other uh, way to structure it is to present all the themes uh, in the substantive topic. And then in the concluding part, um, the authors um, uh, introduce numerous research tasks. So this is one of the studies that I referred to earlier. This is on language awareness, published in language teaching. And this is another one. Uh, this one is on uh, mindset. Uh, in language learning and teaching published in system. So the one published in system here actually uses the, the approach that I mentioned, uh, the second approach, which I mentioned earlier, is the sum, uh, they, they first summarizes the, uh, summarize the different research themes. And then as a conclusion, they present uh, the different research tasks. Okay, so number eight is research into practice. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, the purpose of research into practice is, of course, to look at practical implications of research findings. Um, they resemble uh, narrative reviews, uh, but with a more practical focus, which means they are focusing on the application of research findings in authentic language classrooms. The review process is usually less systematic, at least from the way they are reported. So there is no mention of how the literature was collected and assessed. And, and there is also no mention of how the um, individual studies are selected. Um, and also very often they will include uh, personal experiences because the, the person who's writing a piece often has uh, teaching experiences. So they will add in that reflective and personal, dim uh, personal uh, re uh, dimension to, to the interpretation of findings. Um, text is usually monomodal and structure is less standardized. So they adopt a, a more customized structure presented only in textual form. Um, um, and I think you can um, recall that this type of uh, research, uh, sorry, secondary research, uh, it's a type of, it's a submission type in the journal language teaching. So here are two examples uh, of research into practice. One is on listening strategies, another on written corrective feedback. So here on the slide, I extracted some headings um, um, from one of the uh, research into practice. So what they usually talk about is, sorry about the order of the pictures. So, um, so what they talk about is research findings that are applied very well in the language classroom. That means the language teachers, they get those findings, they're implementing the findings, they're transferring the, the findings into practices. Um, another area that uh, research into practice also addresses is research findings that are not well applied in the language classroom. So the research findings are, are, are there, the empirical evidence is quite strong, but then it seems like the teachers don't really pick up, pick up on those. Um, and, or, and then there will be uh, areas, there will be another section on uh, research findings that are over applied. Um, and just now I mentioned about the, the kind of reflective and personal note in the analytical process. So here you can see uh, uh, the author uh, sharing her own experience as an educator, uh, responding to the literature findings uh, using her own experience as a teacher. And she also talks about um, her personal viewpoints uh, regarding the application of research findings. Okay, number nine is uh, scoping review. And scoping review is uh, a very systematic type of secondary research focusing on uh, research findings. It's very similar to systematic literature review, which I'm gonna introduce in just a minute, but it's usually broader because it identifies specific subdomains. And scoping review is often conducted in areas which are very new 
um, in in uh, in research um, and uh, actually sometimes and very often scoping review it's conducted prior to a more focused systematic literature review. The review process, as I said, is very systematic, very structured. Uh, there is a step-by-step -step description of the uh, synthesis process. Um, uh, synthesis of findings is often done by uh, coding the data thematically. Uh, OK, so somebody is talking. Um, all right. So, OK, so, um, so the synthesis of data usually done by coding, um, calculating frequencies and percentages. Um, the text is uh, multimodal because they have to present a lot of information. Um, so texts are often accompanied with tables and figures. Structure, as you will know now, is more standardized like a primary research paper. So some examples here. So this is a scoping review. Uh, on digital game-based language learning. And as, as you can tell from the topic, it's something uh, very new to the field. It's talking about gamification of language learning. So it's a new area of research and therefore uh, a scoping review was conducted. Um, another, is, uh, another example is a scoping review on Arabic as a heritage language. And again, as, as you can see from the structured abstract there, they have a very systematic um, approach to data. Uh, to methodology and data collection and analysis. And they rely heavily on tables and diagrams. So for example, using the kind of uh, almost like a Prisma diagram uh, to document the uh, search process. Uh, also, they look, uh, they use uh, uh, charts and graphs to document the different types of theoretical frameworks, for example, um, on the right, uh, tables are often used to categorize the different types uh, or different themes. For example, in uh, the game-based language learning paper, they look at different types of games and also uh, what are the definitions of these games and also providing example studies uh, which uh, investigate those types of games. All right, so number 10 is state-of-the-art review. So a state-of-the-art review is a re research-focused type of review. Uh, its characteristic is that it is very, very exhaustive, very comprehensive. For example, if you look at language teachings uh, instruction, uh, you have to include you know, roughly around 100 articles uh, in there. Uh, and the, the purpose is really to point out contradictions and omissions uh, and agreements in the field. So it's it, it's very similar to other types of review in terms of purpose, but then I think what distinguishes this type of review is its scope. It is very, very comprehensive. Um, and the review process, what we found is there are examples of more systematic state-of-the-art review, and there are less systematic state-of-the-art reviews. Um, so sometimes there is an explicit description on how literature is searched, and selected, but sometimes there can be a more personal approach uh, to data analysis. The text is often uh, multimodal, relying uh, on tables and figures uh, in addition to text. Structure can be standardized, can be less standardized depending on the review process. If the review process is more systematic, then the structure is likely to be more standardized. So uh, two examples again. So this is uh, an example uh, from Judith Hanks' uh, exploratory practice uh, paper talking about uh, this form of practitioner research. Um, another example is published in uh, SSLA uh, talking about variables in second language attrition. And so you can see that from this, from Hank's example, this represent a more systematic uh, approach to uh, research, uh, sorry, to um, um, a state of the art review. Uh, it has very focused research questions. For example, here, there are four research questions. Um, there is a whole methodology section dedicated to it. So uh, look, uh, talking about where did the author search 
for the articles um, and how were the articles analyzed. At the same time, as I said, there is like that personal touch and personal note in there as well. So for example, in Hank's paper, even though the search was very systematic, the analysis as the author uh, suggested is very dialogic and very personal that she actually contacted um, different people asking them about their experiences in doing practitioner research and using that dialogue as, as a reference point to interpret um, the synthesized literature. All right, so type 11 is systematic literature review. Um, so a lot of people use the term systematic review as a, a term to denote qualitative uh, research synthesis. So they actually have this concept of, so meta-analysis is quantitative uh, systematic review and systematic literature review is qualitative systematic literature review, which um, I don't think it's it's very accurate uh, because as you can see, there are different types of qualitative research synthesis. So um, anyways, so systematic literature review, the purpose can be research focused and practice focused um, because a lot of the systematic literature review uh, aims to evaluate an existing practice, uh, also aims to assess the quality and the range of studies. Um, and also of course, uh, providing uh, an updated summary of the research base. Um, the review process is more systematic. There is an explicit uh, and separate description of the whole review process. Um, and they also usually will involve multiple reviewers to code the studies and usually data are coded thematically. Um, and then the text is usually multimodal with figures and tables. And I'm sure now you, you don't need me to explain this. The structure is more standardized. It's like a research paper because of the systematic review process. Examples here, the first example is from uh, foreign, foreign language annals, um, uh, focusing on the use of course grades. This is a systematic review. Um, and then this one is a systematic review on EMI in higher education published in uh, language teaching. So you can see that it usually involves more people because of the scope. All right, and the last two, we're entering into the last two uh, types of, of uh, secondary research, which are more emergent and young, I would say in the field. The first type is uh, historical review. Um, so the purpose of a historical review can focus on research, but sometimes it can also focus, uh, focus on practice. And it uses time as an organizing unit uh, and as a way to understand the theoretical, methodological, or substantive development of a topic. Um, and then of course, similar to other types of reviews, it highlights major themes, but I would say not just themes, but developments and changes, advancements uh, in a particular topic. The review process can be more systematic or less systematic. Um, so for example, sometimes the literature search, uh, study appraisal, data extraction, data synthesis, in some examples of historical review, they are explicitly reported, but in some, they are not. Uh, for the text, sometimes it's monomodal, sometimes it's multimodal with figures and tables. And the structure, it's, it also varies. Sometimes it can take the form of a timeline. Um, sometimes it looks like a more standard structure of a primary study. So this is the first example of a historical review. Uh, on motivation research uh, published in System in 2015. Um, so this actually adopts a more systematic uh, research uh, uh, synthesis approach, uh, looking at a total of 416 studies. Um, another one is on pronunciation assessment uh, published in language teaching. Um, so Talia is one of the authors here. Um, so this is a, a specific form of submission for language teaching called research timeline. So basically it's a type of historical review. Um, so going back to the first example, the, the example published in system, uh, it employs um, a 
systematic approach to, uh, to methodology and data collection, uh, reporting the, the search strategies, uh, the keyword used in the search, for example, um, using diagrams um, to denote the frequencies of publications over the years. Um, for Talia's example, it follows a particular format of language teaching. So it, um, the authors divide the, uh, um, the topic into different uh, substantial themes, um, and then they use uh, almost like a timeline format to uh, present uh, a sum a summaries on the selected studies from the earliest to the latest, and then put uh, noting there the themes, the corresponding themes addressed in each study. Um, and then for the very, very last type of um, secondary research is bibliometric re uh, review, or sometimes, sometimes some people call it scientometric review. So um, the purpose of this kind of review is research focused. Um, but then what they are, sorry, what they are interested in is the, the metadata in the publication. So for example, they are very interested in citation. They are interested in citation patterns. They are interested in authorship attributes, for example, the number of authors, the gender of the authors, and where the authors are from. They will also analyze article titles and keywords, uh, and also, for example, international representation of, um, of uh, studies. Uh, review process is more systematic. It's a type of systematic secondary research. So uh, there is an explicit description, an explicit section on how literature is searched, appraised, and how data is extracted and synthesized. Usually they employ very quantitative uh, analytical approaches. The texts are often multimodal. Uh, making very, very good use of tables and figures, as you can tell, because um, they need to present citation patterns, so figures and tables will be very useful. Structure is uh, more standardized, uh, uh, structured like a primary study. Um, so here I have two examples. Both of them are very, very recent. I would say this is one of the least um, well-known uh, type of secondary research in our field. And Luke is actually editing an issue on uh, bibliometric reviews. Um, so this is an, an article in press um, in com computer assisted language learning, talking about uh, co-citation patterns of uh, eye tracking research and language studies. Um, and then uh, Ken Highland and also uh, published um, uh, bibliometric review uh, very recently in 2019, uh, looking at citation patterns of academic papers in applied linguistics. So very, com very complicated uh, diagrams because they usually uh, employ cluster analysis to look at citation patterns, uh, also using tables to look at um, referencing patterns and citation the number of citations. Uh, using diagrams, figures uh, to talk about, again, citation patterns over time. So the summary, I think this is a very neat table, although a little bit small, um, on the 13 types of reviews. So if you look at research focus, um, you will see that uh, the majority of the, research, uh, of the secondary research types that we talked about uh, focus on research. There are only one or two or three uh, types which address uh, practice. And I think this is something that I would like to talk about in the implication. In terms of a systematic approach, um, over half of the secondary research types uh, employ a systematic methodology. Um, in terms of standardized structure, in terms of structure, we can also see that over half of them employ a rather standardized structure um, resembling uh, one that is presented in a primary study paper. Uh, and then in terms of the use of uh, figures and diagrams and tables, uh, they are very common in almost all types of uh, research, uh, sorry, of secondary research. So the very, very last part um, is on implications and recommendations. So what can we get and what can we learn from these 
13 types of secondary research. Uh, from the perspective of a research versus practice focused continuum, as, as I said earlier, currently there is a dearth of reviews uh, which focus on practice. A lot of people, when they think about secondary research, they think about, oh, it is very useful for researchers uh, because they could know what has been done and what needs to be done. But actually, as I argued in one of my papers in ELT Journal that uh, research synthesis or secondary research has a role to play in bridging the research pedagogy uh, uh, divide, especially when teachers or practitioners, policymakers, they don't have time to read so many primary studies. And if you give them uh, a synthesis of something, um, they could read one paper, but they actually get the whole picture. Maybe the, the, the synthesis is uh, summarizing you know, over a hundred studies. So it saves them a lot of time. Um, and because of the way that findings are presented in secondary research, usually in diagrams, tables, very easy to comprehend. So uh, I argue in this paper that there is a lot of untapped potential in research synthesis for practitioners and for policymakers, which I don't seem to see uh, in the current state of the art. Um, and then from the angle of a more systematic and less systematic continuum, uh, there is ambiguity of the review processes in some types of secondary research. The most obvious example I mentioned is the two narrative reviews published in the same issue in applied linguistics. Um, and interestingly, they uh, employ quite different uh, methodological approaches. So what we can do is to conduct, and this is actually what I would like to do uh, as a follow-up of this paper, is to conduct a comprehensive reviews on the methodologies uh, used in each type of secondary research and the variations. It's very hard to do because as I said, people name their reviews uh, as different things. For example, they may name it as a, a review of something. So you don't really know what kind of review it is, or they will say it's a meta synthesis or meta analysis. Uh, I have seen an article using the term meta analysis, but it's actually a qualitative uh, research synthesis. Um, but thankfully, nowadays we have something uh, produced by the University of Oxford called the International Database of Education Systematic Reviews. Their stage one project focuses on language education reviews. So I think as more and more reviews are added to the da database, it will become a very valuable source uh, for us to conduct methodological reviews on secondary research. Um, and then when we think about the structure, uh, the organization of uh, the review papers itself, uh, reviews which adopt a more systematic and scientific uh, review protocol are usually represented in a more standardized structure. And while those which are written in a commentary style are usually more flexible because they would usually organize uh, their paper by themes, uh, the major issues that they would like to discuss in the review, so in order to understand structural variations, I think from a genre analysis perspective, it's important to look at um, different moves, different structural moves, different structural turns, looking at different discourse functions and communicative purposes of, of, uh, of each part. So again, we need a corpus of uh, secondary research in applied linguistics and TESOL in order to do this. And it, I, I believe it will be very time consuming, but I think it will yield very, very valuable insights uh, into how we can better conduct and standardize uh, methodological practices. Um, and then when, when we look at the typology from the perspective of multimodality, uh, we notice that over half of the secondary research types adopt multimodal representation, meaning using a combination of text, figures, and tables. Um, and I think one area that I am very interested in, in exploring is to look at the science of using science practice. That means how we get people to use the research findings. Um, so uh, for example, I'm very interested in, uh, in looking at uh, the types of diagrams, how, they, how authors use diagrams and tables uh, to summarize findings in a, in a user-friendly way or reader-friendly way uh, to uh, 
convey these findings to not only researchers, but uh, practitioners and policymakers. Uh, because I think very often those people are at the forefront uh, in the profession, and they are the ones uh, making decisions affecting the industry, uh, affecting education. So we have to think about not just synthesizing what we know, but presenting the synthesis in a way that even non-researchers would like to read, because it's very time consuming to read the whole paper. Um, so how can we do that better by using figures and diagrams or other means? Um, nowadays, uh, different publishers have been advocating the use of, for example, video abstracts or like a graphic summary uh, of your paper. So these are things that we can look at to kind of better communicate synthesized findings to other stakeholders in education. So <laughs> a little bit of promotion here. Uh, Tali already talked about this. So if you are interested in research synthesis and secondary research, and you would like to know more about it, I'm actually organizing um, uh, a two-day online seminar, uh, and this uh, seminar is uh, funded by the British Association for Applied Linguistics and Cambridge University Press um, on the 10th, of, uh, 10th and 11th of June this year. Um, and I'm very, very honored to have a very strong lineup of speakers. Uh, we have Luke as one of the keynote speakers, and Talia will be um, another keynote speakers talking about uh, how we can learn from other disciplines, uh, synthesis practices. And we'll also have Mel also from UCL, from the Epi Center, talking about uh, using softwares to conduct um, a systematic literature review. Um, and the first call for paper deadline is the 9th of April. Um, so it's coming up and we welcome uh, submissions, uh, presentations on three areas. The first area is a substantive area, which means you may be working on a, a secondary research um, on a specific topic. It could be ongoing, it could be completed, and you would like to share that piece of secondary research, and you're welcome to do so, to submit the abstract uh, for consideration or you are very interested in discussing methodological issues and paradigms of uh, research synthesis, then you can also submit a methodological paper, um, or you would like to discuss something conceptual related to the applications of uh, secondary research. For example, something I talked about, how we get other stakeholders to use uh, synthesized uh, findings. Um, so if you are interested, uh, this is the website. Uh, of the seminar. Um, so you can scan the QR code there. I'll just give you some time to do that in case you're interested. Um, so you can find all the information there. You can um, look at the, 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 at the abstracts of the, of the keynote speakers and featured speakers. Uh, you can also look at the schedule. You can look at the background. You can look at um, uh, the payment method. And uh, you also um, can, uh, there will also be information about how you can contact the organizer uh, if you want to know more about the seminar. So that's it, basically. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Sin Wang. Um, I think um, we would hear some uh, applause if you were <laughs> doing this live. But um, anyway, that was a, a wonderful, thought-provoking talk. I mean, um, you know, so yes, we've got lots of um, applause <laughs> emojis here. So that's great. Um, and we have had a few, quite a few questions. So just, um, you know, in the chat, I have posted links to things that um, you've referred to, including um, the seminar um, on research synthesis and um, the uh, database of education systematic review. So please um, look at, in the chat if you want the links to those um, sites. And we do have um, some questions from at least four people. Um, I think I'm going to start with Linda Taylor's question. Hi, Linda. Um, so Linda asks, um, and it sort of bridges from what you were talking about in your last slide, the last few points that you raised. Um, so she writes, I imagine it's relatively easy to measure the uptake of differing types of systematic review articles within the applied linguistics research community, for example, via citations or maybe impact factors. But how easy is it to evaluate the usefulness or appropriateness of particular review types
perhaps in terms of implications for the world beyond research. So of course she's talking about sort of stakeholders beyond the academy. So the impact factor on practice is, is how she terms it. Um, and is some sort of mediation process needed to achieve this end? Any yeah. thoughts? Thank you, Linda, for, for your question. This is something that I, I'm very passionate about, uh, you know, like uh, communicating the synthesized findings to stakeholders beyond uh, academia. And it refers, I, I would refer to a notion called the uh, synthesis ecology. So when they talk about this ecology, it's not just the, the methodologists, the researchers, but it actually involves people outside of academia. And the key question we have to ask ourselves, in addition to the methodology, because I think a lot of people nowadays are thinking about how can we conduct research synthesis when they are so excited about meta-analysis because they can run all those statistical tests, which are great. Um, but more importantly, it's after we have the, the outcome, we publish the synthesis, um, then what? So what do you, you think the uh, practitioners will take a look at it? Um, you know, think about that mixed review examples that I just, I just shared. It's 70 pages long. Um, I'm not sure who will be reading every single word in that article. So we have to think of more innovative ways to present findings, present synthesized findings. So I mentioned something like, um, how do we use, for example, infographics, uh, diagrams, tables to summarize everything very neatly in a page that even people who don't have access to the full articles, or even though they, they don't have time to read the full article, they can get the gist uh, of the synthesis. And I remember there was a book recently published by Rowledge. It has nothing to do with uh, research synthesis, but it's something about um, uh, teaching and learning in general, very, very general. And they have like, they have selected 70 studies or something like that, that are very representative. And they present the studies in, um, in a way that is very attractive to teachers. They have like a one page or two page summaries, very attractive graphics, infographics are used. And then they always end with like a practical uh, implication or they, they have a section called what it looks like in practice. Uh, so they, they I think it is something that we have to look at uh, when we talk about secondary research, not just the methodology. So I think it is not easy, I agree, but I think it is something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a question um, from Nathan Thomas. Um, he, it's a specific question. Um, he writes, I'm currently working on a review that follows systematic review protocols, but it doesn't consider research findings. Instead, it looks at research contexts, participant characteristics, research methods, definitions, and theoretical frameworks. What would you call something like that? Would it still be considered a systematic review if it doesn't examine research findings? If um, it does, however, do more than just look at methods, re a methodological review. <laughs> Hmm. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So it's is it so is it like a protocol of the review that it's so, so it's like a I think he the, says following research review protocols, he means um, by the he doesn't mean I think Nathan, you don't mean a protocol, you mean sort of um, conventions. So he's following convent mm -hmm. the conventions of systematic review prisma and so on and so forth. I would have thought okay. is that Right. But, it doesn't, but it doesn't consider research. Findings. It doesn't look at the findings, but it and considers yeah. context, okay. characteristics, right. methods. I mean, I mean, what counts as findings, right? Um, so, for example, if you look at the last type of review, the bibliometric one, the findings, the so-called interest points, if I may, just just a more layman term, uh, would be the citations and author backgrounds. Where are the author from? Um, the genders of the authors. So, these are considered data and findings to that particular type of review. So for example, I, I was thinking about uh, one type of review which is not found in our field, but in other fields, it's rapid review. So there is something called rapid review that uh, people are uh, trying to sum summarize findings uh, on a topic 
with urgency. For example, there are a number of rapid reviews published on uh, emergency remote teaching and learning, for example, because of COVID. And so people do these reviews very quickly because they want to get the findings out very quickly uh, without sacrificing the quality uh, to inform practice. So uh, for those rapid reviews, they won't be really synthesizing the findings because you can imagine for COVID related studies, they won't have a lot of primary data they, will, they may have some ideas or comments or observations. So for uh, these kind of rapid reviews, they will summarize like uh, the, the type of research, like uh, primary studies, there are 10, prim uh, uh, 10 primary studies, 20 commentaries, um, and then uh, you know uh, half of them are qualitative, half of them mixed methods, you know, something like this. So they, they won't really go to the findings of uh, the included studies, but only focusing on analyzing the methodologies. I, I, I think it is what you you talk about, I think, if I haven't misinterpreted. So I think that's kind of the rapid review. And, and something that goes with rapid re review and something I'm doing right now, it's something called the living rapid review. Uh, it's a very weird term, actually. Uh, but what, what it means is really you keep on updating the review. So it's not a closed and complete process. So you publish something, but you have the database available online public uh, to the public, and you will keep adding uh, new studies to it as new studies emerge. And I think uh, Mel has, as I mentioned, one of the featured speakers, she has published a rapid, a living rapid review on COVID related uh, teaching and learning. Um, and using the software uh, uh, produced by the uh, Epicenter at UCL. Uh, I think she will talk more about that in, in the seminar. So I think uh, that is also something very helpful and uh, to consider as well. Thank you. I think that bridges nicely to a question uh, by Jim McKinley, who thank you, Jim, for uh, working out the logistics of this talk, by the way. Um, so Jim asks, what uh, would you recommend as the appropriate type of review for students at the master's level to engage in for their dissertation, considering they have to work individually and in a short time frame? So this is a very practical question. Um, students, of course, in, in, the, in the midst of this pandemic can't uh, collect any face-to-face data collection, at least at UCL, um, or it's very difficult to. Um, so many are turning to sort of um, review methods. And so what would your suggestion be given the very limited resources and time? Yeah, there has been a, a lot of discussions in our university actually about uh, asking or encouraging students to conduct uh, systematic reviews. Um, something that I, I should start with is some people approach this uh, by saying this uh, systematic review is an alternative, is a replacement. It's something like less than primary primary studies. So it's like I can't conduct a primary study now because of COVID. So I have to resort to a systematic review. I think that mindset has to go. Um, they are equal. They serve different purposes. They are equally important. So I think the first question I will I will have to uh, have to ask the. Uh, postgraduate students, if you want to uh, conduct a systematic literature review, uh, what's the reason? Are you looking for an easy way out? If you're thinking it's an easy way out, it's not. Um, very often it, it involves more work, um, to be honest, so, or you're actually, you actually want to really survey the landscape of a research field. So you have to ask yourself, what is the reason for you to do that? The second question you have to ask yourself is, uh, the practical questions, how, how much time you have um, and how much time you're willing to involve, and then to pick the type of review that um, is suitable. Some types of review, for example, like the state of the art reviews that I mentioned, uh, it requires like almost 100 or more articles to, to be qualified as a state of the art review, which is something you may not want to do as a, as a, as a MSc thesis, for example. Um, so it, uh, if you pick something more, for example, like uh, meta-analysis. So if you are very uh, well-trained in statistics, go for it, right? But a lot of the students, at least the students that I encounter, they may not have any statistical training. So if you say, oh, I'm so excited about the meta-analysis because of all the numbers and calculations and formulas, I get excited, uh, but you can't do it because you don't have any training. So you have to be realistic about it. So the most, I think the easiest way to start is to start with a systematic literature review or a qualitative research synthesis, because these types require you um, to code the data, 
So you may have already learned how to code using different approaches in a research methods course. And even you're not subscribed to any uh, data analysis software, you can do the coding pretty easily and it could be very straightforward. Um, so this is something you can, I, I would suggest. I would not suggest you do something non-systematic for the thesis because I think the examiners and your supervisors would want to see like the methodology and how you analyze, how you synthesize. If you just do like a narrative review, like a, uh, in a descriptive way, then I, I don't think uh, that, will, that, that will be very appropriate for your, for your master's dissertation. That's excellent advice. And there's also this question about sort of bringing in a second person to do some of the coding. So maybe just a very small proportion of the data, you could bring in somebody else who's doing another systematic um, method. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of really good questions from uh, Ellen Head. And the first of her questions um, is actually one that I had, and it has to do with um, the ordering um, of your typology. So. Um, she asks, how did you decide on the order 1 to 13? It seems not quite chronological. And then um, she then says, also the use of AI um, has surely changed the possibilities and popularity of research synthesis articles. Do you want to yeah, tackle that so, one? <laughs> so the ordering, it's alphabetical. <laughs> That's it. So <laughs> it's a, we, we didn't really, we don't want to rank them. We don't want to say which is more important. Uh, of course, I already mentioned earlier that the most common type would definitely be meta-analysis and narrative reviews, which are very, very common. Uh, but we did not consider ranking them and ordering them, and we don't think it's constructive and meaningful to do this. Uh, about your second question on AI, I think, um, yes, it's true. I have used different text mining softwares, actually, actually Lexi Menser is something I used for one of my, my systematic review, which really helped to look at clusters of keywords, or even if you use something like Envivo, it would be, it could generate like keywords, uh, frequent words in the reviews, and you can start, it gives you a starting point of, of analysis. So definitely uh, helpful. I just want to go back to the previous question a little bit about master's students. I, I think I, I have one more point to say is that we have in the methodology, um, because we only have one person in a team, we don't have a, a whole team. Your supervisor can't work with you on that. It's your own work. So I think we have to be honest with the limitations. So we just have to say, you know, in this context, this is what can be done. We can't do A, we can't do B. We wish we could, but we cannot. Um, so we just have to be honest with the limitations, uh, but we don't try to overclaim what we do. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, I muted the wrong person. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, and, and now I have to unmute you, uh, Sin Wang, because I think, Jim, can you unmute Sin Wang? I think I pressed a wrong button there. Um, yeah. Um, yes, I'll just go to one more question from Ellen. Um, she asks, of course, something um, uh, that you touched on just there. Uh, many of the articles are done by two people. Uh, does this guard against bias or just help to cope with the reading amount, she asks? I think both, right? So, um, so usually we have two people because of biases, because of uh, intercoder reliability. Um, so it just, because, um, um, I think I mentioned at one point that, especially if you're doing systematic uh, secondary research, you will see more than one people because we want the whole process to be objective, to be transparent, to be to a certain extent reproducible, not exactly because of time. Um, uh, another reason is, of course, because of workload. Um, uh, usually for a real uh, review published in high ranking journals in our field, you would see it, it would be over 50 or something, some even more, depending on the topic. So it's a huge amount of work. But sometimes, you know, even they have a few people, those people would actually read all the articles. So we don't really do it like, oh, we have 100 articles, I will read 50, and Talia will be, read another 50, and we share the workload. Well, that doesn't really work, but we will actually read all 100 and compare notes uh, to, to look at any issues we may have, uh, especially during the data extraction um, stage. Yeah. 
Um, quite selfishly, Sing Wang, I have a couple of questions, actually several questions. Sure. I'll limit myself to two at the yeah. moment. And um, if there are any other questions, please um, type them in the chat box. We have um, just an, uh, over five minutes here and then we'll close. Um, but I was very interested about sort of the variability within each review type. I'm, I, I picked up that for narrative reviews, there was quite a bit of convergence, even within the same special issue. Um, and then also for historical uh, historical review, I think you had, um, you know, plus slash minus in the summary table. And uh, that's interesting. So do you think that that we need to kind of achieve some consensus about what these um, different reviews mean? And do you think we need to be better at sort of labeling our reviews, uh, our reviews appropriately. Um, and do you have any idea of um, how much, like to, to what extent secondary researchers who conduct reviews label them um, as such? And is this a practice that you would like to encourage? Do you think it is appropriate and important uh, for researchers to label the kind of um, secondary research that they're doing? Um, or is this not so important? Yeah, I think there are uh, there are several stages to this. I think the first stage we should do is to observe and identify variations. I think this is where we are at now. Um, before we can say we try to systemize. So the next step, what I want to do is really to look at real examples, actually all the examples of different, different types of re reviews and secondary research to look at variations, just the methodology maybe, um, to look at whether variations exist. Um, the two types of uh, secondary research you mentioned, there are variations because of uh, the journal requirements. For example, Talia, your article is submitted to language teaching, which has a specific format for timeline section. So you have to follow the, 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 the requirements. And the other example is published in system, which has a different uh, re set of requirements. So I think this partially is the, is the reason why there are variations. The other reason why there are variations is of course the researchers understanding and experiences of, of secondary research. They may call, they may have a different understanding of narrative reviews, as I suggested earlier. So I think after we observe and identify patterns and variations, the next step is really to, to have people who are interested to sit together and talk about good practices. And I think we don't have to standardize everything. Sometimes it's a matter of writing it very clearly what you do and what you didn't do. Um, and it, it's also maybe a um, uh, for people who are new to research synthesis, um, this may be a, a reason why some of them are a little bit hesitant to approach this type of research because they don't really know what the standards are. So I think it is more useful instead of standardizing to have like a, like a baseline, uh, like, a, like a bottom line uh, level of expectations or you know uh, desired level of expectations or the like the best practices we can have like different tiers of expectations um, that's why you know something that uh, my university is talking is to develop their in-house uh, guide on uh, doing systematic review for postgraduate students I think it could be very university based um, and discipline based but I think we need guidelines. Uh, but we have to start with observation. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently working on it, but I found it very difficult because of the names, because you try to find all qualitative research synthesis, but some of them don't call themselves qualitative synthesis. They call themselves narrative review, but they are actually qualitative research synthesis. So it's very challenging. So that's why I think at least at the naming level, we should be consistent with what we call something. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we don't want to be too prescriptive, but still want to have some sort of rules of thumb. I'll ask just one very last quick question and then we'll close. Um, it was a question about, um, I was interested to see that you, you one of the uh, main categories that you looked at was uh, monomodal and multimodal. Mm -hmm. And um, I think multimodal usually implies the use of diagrams and tables. Um, and I, 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 did you see any, um, audio or audiovisual uh, input as part of multimodal? And do you think that this is the future of, uh, you know, some type of synthesis? Yeah, I think definitely I don't see any actual examples, but I can see, as I said earlier, what the publishers are trying to encourage authors to do is to submit an 
uh, a video abstract. For example, the article that was just accepted by Tiso Quadley with Luke, uh, I was actually invited by the publishers to submit um, a, a video abstract. So, uh, or some, some of the other publishers, they will have like graphic abstract or something else. I think this will be very, very helpful uh, to translate the synthesized findings to other um, stakeholders. Um, I just want to address one question from Barry because I saw that it's about the, the, the methodology books that you would recommend for yeah, students sure. and masters and PhD. I think one of the slides that I mentioned about Jim's uh, book on research methodologies, Rowledge Handbook, uh, I think that's a very, very good place to start because they have two very short chapters, uh, one on meta-analysis, another one on systematic review. So I think those are, especially the systematic review one, I think it's really nice uh, that summarizes the whole procedure. So if anyone is interested in doing that as a starting point, you can take a look at James' book. There is a chapter on systematic review. And then from there, um, you, can, uh, you can look for more resources. That's a great plug. Um, we need to end the talk now, but thank you so much, um, all of you for coming and um, especially to Sin Wang for this um, really stimulating um, talk uh, and, and um, very comprehensive, it seems to me, typology. Um, and so thank you very much. And um, we look on behalf of the UCL Center for Applied Linguistics, and um, we look forward to um, maybe seeing some of you at um, the uh, seminar that you're organizing on this topic, Sing Wang. And of course, you can check out a YouTube video um, of this talk um, very shortly, right, Jim? Do you have any final words, Jim? I was just going to say thank you to everyone who's attended all of the seminars this year. This is the, the final one that we have scheduled for the 2020-2021 uh, season. So we have started up the YouTube channel and Sin Wong has kindly agreed to allow us to post this recording there and I'm sure it will be very popular. So please do check the link uh, for YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.